future energy storage. How nanomaterials pave the way for revolutionary technologies. Valeria Nicolosi, Trinity College, Dublin. On the 9th of November 1989, I was 12, and I remember my mother asking me to the TV to watch one of the biggest chapters in modern history. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is a huge pleasure to be here today in front of you all. In Berlin, such a beautiful city full of history and such a special day, it is truly amazing. So today I'm going to start asking you a question. That's how I decided to open my speech. Who here in the audience has an electric car or is planning to buy an electric car next? Raise your hands, please. That's good. I see some hands raising. That basically is the symptom that indeed our society is moving towards uh, something greener, something more sustainable. And in fact, uh, well, we've been hearing a lot of talks today. This is highly necessary. So if we think about how one of those uh, electric cars works, well, it's battery dependent, it's battery driven. What I have here, guys, is the, electric, the, the, car, the battery of a normal car, a fueled car. 15 kilos, more or less. It's not that I exaggerate, it's really, really heavy. Uh, imagine the battery of an electric car. Well, it is fully embedded in the skateboard-like chassis of the car itself. So it is quite a piece. And if we look into the details of this, well, it looks like that. It is weighing 440 kilograms in average. It's something really, really heavy. Um, it is capable of sustaining the car for about 600 kilometers and is made of about 7,100 single lithium-ion batteries like this one. To charge it, it takes about 10 hours if you use one of those power stations on the road, or about 5.5 hours if you use the socket plugged in the, in the wall. So this is the state-of-the-art technology that we have today. However, I'm hoping to show you by the end of my talk that in future we can do better and we must. So when we think about ways of storing energy, well, we go to our mind to two of the main technologies that we have today to store energy, supercapacitors and batteries. And what you see there is what we call uh, a Ragone plot. You have on the x-axis um, energy density, um, which is basically how much energy one device can store. And on the x-axis, you have uh, power density, which is a parameter that tells us how fast it can charge and discharge. Uh, you see there, supercapacitors and batteries, they're both made more or less in the same way. You have a cathode, an anode, and an electrolyte, a charged electrolyte in between. But the way they store energy is significantly different, it's very different. So if we take the supercapacitor, for example, energy stored uh, electrostatically at the interface between the, the electrodes and the electrolyte. So it's an electrostatic charge. And uh, as you can see from the Racone plot, it cannot store a huge amount of energy, but the quality is that it can charge and discharge extremely quickly. So uh, if you look at the, practical, uh, the practicalities, you will see that the cost is very, very high, but the great advantage is that the lifetime is very long. So if, you, if we look into the market and see what is the state of the art of this technology, we will see that it's a, we have to go to China, all the way to China. They have electric buses fully operated on supercapacitors. They cannot go very far. They can go maximum about five kilometers, but it's just enough to go from stop to stop. And by, by the time the passengers leave the bus and jump in, the supercapacitors recharges again, and off it goes for another five kilometers. 
If we go back to our Ragone plot, we instead look at the batteries on the left-hand side of, of the graph. And we realize straight away that they can store more energy, far more energy than supercapacitors. And, but the, the thing is that they are very, very slow at charging and discharging. The way a battery stores energy is electrochemically. So you have a redox reaction between the cathode, the anode, through the liquid electrolyte in there. Their cost is very, very cheap but I'm sure we are all aware of what it, the crucial problem in batteries is. The lifetime is dreadful. It's really, really bad. And the reason is because of the redox reaction that is happening. Every time we cycle, in this, in, uh, we cycle the battery, we charge and discharge, the electrodes get damaged. For example, if we look at a pristine electrode from uh, an off-the-shelf battery, in a, in a microscope, will look like that. It's pristine, it's perfect. If we look at that, after 100 times we've been using it, charging and discharging, it's all cracked already. If we look at it after 300 times of usage, it's all like that, it's pulverized. This is the reason why we buy a laptop. Initially, the battery will last six hours, and after a year, we have to keep it plugged. And, uh, this is the truth, unfortunately. And uh, we have been talking about the fact that batteries can store more energy uh, than supercapacitors, and that is true. But uh, is that energy enough? Well, if we look at the state of the art technology, again, we have to go all the way to Siberia, uh, to, to Alaska, sorry. All the way, all the other way <laughs> to Alaska. Uh, this battery here, occupies an area of half a football pitch. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's quite gigantic. And if you look at the details, um, and if the power goes off uh, in, in that village, well, this battery will be able to sustain a population of 12,000 people for seven minutes. That's hope, and that's the state of the art, the most efficient battery on the planet. So this is the wall that we have to break. This is what we have to start doing better. We have to work on materials that perform better. And what we're doing in my lab, is we're working with novel materials. One of them is uh, uh, graphene. Graphene is a one atom thin layer of carbon atoms arranged in an hexagonal lattice, like you see there in the picture. This is the, the thinnest, the lightest, the strongest material known to man. It is harder than diamond and is 300 times stronger than steel. It was discovered by two colleagues at the University of Manchester, Andrew Geim and uh, Kostya Novoselov, who won the Nobel Prize for shortly after the discovery for, for this amazing new material that they came up with. And in fact, the way they discovered it was very, very easy. They took a, a, a thick piece of graphite, exactly the same that we have in the pencils lead that we all have found here in the falling wall uh, breakout sessions there. And they sc used scotch tape to exfoliate, to take off layer by layer uh, all the little sheets of, of graphene until they, they, they found under the microscope that they had isolated one atom thin graphene. This, is, this was a, a revolutionary discoverer, of course, but it's very, very hard to envisage the application of this material into the real world where huge quantities are needed. So what we did in my lab, at Trinity College and uh, with, with some colleagues, was uh, we developed a methodology to produce graphene in large quantities. So what we did is, well, the, the, the techniques that we still use nowadays, we take thick graphite that we buy uh, off the bucket, it comes to my, in my lab, to my lab in buckets, and we have found a way to use conventional organic solvents and the help of ultrasonic chemistry or shear mixing to obtain stable dispersions like this one, which contain billions and billions and billions of graphene sheets in dispersion floating around. And if we go to the microscope, they look quite nice. 
And recently, uh, we have commercialized this methodology, and everyone in the world now can buy graphene produced in this way. But we didn't stop here. We actually know that in, in nature, there are hundreds and hundreds of different layered crystals, which can be exfoliated exactly like graphene. Um, and in fact, the wonderful properties of these materials are plentiful. Some of them are metallic, some of them are semiconducting with all sorts of bang gaps, some of them are insulating. I just named the three building blocks of electronics just now, as well as having a, a wonderful range of other properties, mechanical strengths, um, optical properties, and so forth. So we basically have a palette of materials, of ultra-thin materials to use, like if we were using Lego blocks. We can take all the single materials that we want and we can put together a macro material that we like with all the properties that we want. And in fact, because we can exfoliate them in liquid, we can use this as inks that we can use for printing as well. And I have a, a, a surprise for you all. I have here my postdoc, uh, Matthias Kremer, uh, who actually is going to print some uh, devices just here while I'm finishing my talk. So please, he deserves it. He's been working like crazy. So a huge round of applause for Matthias. As you can see, we can print on every, any substrate you like, plastic, paper, and so forth. But we didn't stop there. And, and the, the, the reason for which is that, well, we, we didn't stop there because the, 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 the most important thing is that using these materials are building blocks. And the reason why we want to use 2D materials for energy storage is evident. They can use electricity very well, they have a lot of surface area, so they can actually store a lot of energy. Uh, they are mechanically very, very robust. And because they are robust and because they conduce electricity very well, we have been able to make conventional batteries, uh, like the coin cell battery that you see there, but with very, very, very thick electrodes, which means that the more material you have there, the more energy you can store. And that graph there tells you that they, you can actually produce batteries with a very high aerial capacitance. We have achieved about 20 uh, milliamps hour per centimeter square against the 4 milliamps hour per centimeter square that a normal battery has. But we didn't stop there because we can exfoliate in liquid and because we, they are ultra thin and become transparent, we've been able to make transparent supercapacitors like this one. There you have a fully assembled supercapacitor. You have a cathode, an anode, and the electrolyte there. And it's flexible as well. And it's 95% transparent. There is overimposed on my postdoc's smartphone to show you how it is. And not only that, they work very well. If we look at how their electrochemistry, for me, looking at this is like looking at a Picasso. It's a masterpiece for electrochemists because it tells me that this works very, very well. It's highly capacitive, can store a lot of energy, but also can charge and discharge very, very quickly. So if I had to rely on this device, to uh, run a, an electric bus, I will already go for about 25 kilometers, as supposed to five, and I could charge it within 30 seconds. But also, they can last a very long time. They can produce, they can consistently keep their efficiency up to 24,000 cycles. This is huge. This means that if I have to rely on this device, I do not need to change it in my lifetime or my children's lifetime, or in my children's children's lifetime. So it's quite remarkable. We didn't stop there either, because we are aware that many communities don't have available expensive printers or uh, expensive equipment. So what we uh, developed was a very easy and cheap technology to stamp, very, very uh, upscalable as well, to stamp devices on any surface. We 3D print a roll and we use these inks 
to actually uh, stamp on basically any surface. But we didn't stop there. We are now entering the 3D printing uh, world and we can start uh, producing electrodes and uh, batteries and supercapacitors of any shape you like. Uh, and this is particularly important if you think about all those applications that require a very high degree of customization. Think about a peacemaker that needs to be uh, made on, according to the size and the body of each person. We are all different. And imagine this peacemaker being powered by one of those devices that do not need to be changed in the lifetime of the person, rather than going through painful surgeries uh, after one after the other. So I would be lying to you if I would tell you that we don't have walls, we still have walls to break, uh, but uh, we have to think how to get there. We have commercialization to go through, we have to test these batteries in the real world, they have to work in the Sahara Desert as well as uh, uh, in Alaska. So plus 50, minus 30. And uh, uh, we have to upscale the way we produce these things. So we've been talking about breaking walls all day. <laughs> what did you just do? <laughs> <laughs> so we have been talking about breaking walls all day, but what if instead we start thinking about opening a door and using a key that we found? Thank you. <laughs>